Oh, my friend, I mean, how can it go wrong from here? <laughs> what a morning. What a morning. And I'm so grateful. When the Lord is in the house, uh, when he comes to speak and to direct, to inspire, uh, it makes this part a whole lot easier. So as we submit to him, he will speak a word. So don't think it's coming from me. You look directly unto the Lord. Well, our theme, of course, for the past few weeks has been, and I want to say it this way, um, it's not just joy, it's everyday joy. Because we're not looking for intermittent joy. That's what some of us have had. And it's not satisfying. It's not satisfying. It, we don't want to feel good on Sunday joy. Okay, we want to feel good on Sunday. We don't want just a good Sunday feel. But we want daily joy that accompanies and sustains us through all the ups and downs that constitute this journey we call life. So to help us embrace this kind of daily life-giving joy, um, we need to talk about our habits. Okay, just turn to your neighbor and say, she's talking to you. She's talking to you, um, and now you, she's talking to herself as well. She is. Your habits, my habits, good or bad, will dictate the quality and the trajectory of your life. This is true in the physical and in the spiritual realm. I'm going to read some examples, and, and maybe it applies to you. Maybe it applies to somebody you know, but can you relate to a few of these? If you spend all of your discretionary funds and never save for a rainy day, when it does rain, you'll be wet and broke. If you waste time, you will never have enough of it. If you worry about everything, where are my worriers? Right here. If we worry about everything then we will erode our ability to trust anything. If you constantly complain, you forfeit contentment. But if you practice gratitude, you can find joy in the smallest things. When we talk about our habits, these are the things that we habitually do. What we're really talking about is our default mode. And what I'm suggesting is that for some of us, we need to press reset on the factory settings that God created us to have. What we're going to study this morning may sound to some people like an impossibility. Uh, and, and we may be tempted when we read this passage to resist the truth. Anybody? Like when you hear something and in your soul you're just kind of pushing back. We may want to resist that truth um, and, and argue with it with what we see are the hard facts of our own personal experience. Okay, listen. When it comes to spiritual truth and freedom in Christ, you and I are not limited by our personal experience. Instead, we have the opportunity today to follow Paul's example when he described his determination. Look, I'm going to press hold. I'm not press hold. I'm going to press on and take hold of what the Lord Jesus has taken hold of for me. Okay, so that's what we want. So to begin, I just want to encourage you and me we're going to open our minds. We're going to open our hearts to receive what God wants to say today. So if you're not already there, do turn to Philippians chapter 4. Where we're going to continue our study through this glorious, joyous letter. I'm going to be reading from the NIV. You'll see it on the screen or use your own, of course. Beginning with verse 4. Philippians 4. Verse 4 to 9, and he, he says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. 
Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there's anything excellent, praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Okay. So one method of biblical interpretation uh, that's useful is to notice what the passage says specifically about God. It is his revelation to us. So we can look at the text and say, what am I learning about God here? And, and given Paul's use of repetition in verse 4, it's clear that God desires his people. He desires you and me to be habitually joyful. And my fear is that some of us, upon reading that command, immediately think, well, that's just not me. Or I, I can't do that. Or I can't do that in this season. And I just want to ask if over the next few minutes we can release our doubts and embrace the powerful truth that God's will for us is good. He desires our good. And think about this. Of all the things that God could rightly require of us, just take in the realization that he wants us to be happy. Not because of temporary circumstances, but because of eternal joy that we have in him. In John 15, Jesus says it this way, I've told you these things so that my joy may be in you, get this, and your joy may be complete. Complete joy. God's joy, our everyday experience of it, it's our inheritance. And I just want to ask you today, do you want to own it? Do you want to own it? And if so, just lean, let's lean into this truth so we can align our lives to it. So I have summarized the opening principle of continuous joy in verse 4 just into two words so that we can repeat it, memorize it, and live it. Okay? So if our lives are to be characterized by joy, it will come as a habit of rejoicing always and again. So repeat after me, always and again. Always and again. Now tell your neighbor, always and again. Always and again. Now close your eyes, say it again, always and again. Okay, so we have to begin by understanding what, what does rejoicing look like in this context? Because that can be a, a pretty churchy word to use, right? That we, we may not even know what, it, what we're saying or, or worse, we're just trying to sound religious. Oh, I'm rejoicing in the Lord. I don't even know what it is. I'm just going to say rejoice. Let's don't do that. Let's know what it is. And, and to rejoice in the Lord, it means to be full of good cheer, to be glad to be well, to be well with your soul. And what makes this type of joy uniquely different and uniquely powerful is its object, which is the Lord, right? The joy we're talking about today does not come within ourselves or a result of activities that we find joyful or pleasing. And I say that because I think the fact that it's an imperative command in the text has led me to misunderstand and misapply the intention as meaning that God wants me to find a reason to be happy as if it's up to me to unearth and produce joy as a result of this mental or spiritual inventory. Does that make sense? It's a lot of words. Y'all, I cannot help it. I will use 50 words when two will do. But am I making sense? Okay. It's not empowering, this is not so 
profound, but our first point is this. Everyday joy finds its origin in God. Okay. And that's so important because it, it, it cannot be bought. It cannot be manipulated. It cannot be manufactured. But it's freely given. It's your inheritance. Now, whereas I most often think of joy as, as being an act that we give to the Lord, which it certainly can be, here it seems to be more of an act of receiving, like take in the joy of the Lord. Okay? What did you do to embrace my Always and again. So I want to uh, remind you, remember when the disciples were on that, that wind-tossed boat? And Jesus comes to them on the water. He addresses their fear in Scripture by saying, the first thing he says, I'm here, take courage. Okay? I think in the same way here he says, I'm here, take joy. I'm here, take courage joy. It's not something, I think some of us have been um, trying to produce it ourselves. We're living off of the own, our own joy that we're trying to make. And I, do I need to tell you, it's not enough. It's got to come from him. He is the source of our joy. Receiving God's joy, that's where the Christian life begins. And I really hope, I'm so glad today's baptism day. I, I, who was here, was it three weeks ago, four weeks ago, when we had baptism? And those who witnessed it saw on the faces, their countenance changed. When their lives were buried in the water and raised to new life, they had joy. It was evident. Joy for us, for believers, is the beginning, it is the middle, and it is the end of our lives. Which is why Paul tells us, rejoice always, always. God's will is that we would immerse ourselves in his goodness and experience his joy actively, presently, and continuously. And I just, I know, I want to be so careful with those of you who are in a very difficult situation right now. I, I hear you. But what I'm saying, what, no, what scripture tells us is that joy in the very hardest place is possible. It's present. It's present. And we want it, Lord. We want it. Okay. I don't think anybody, um, unless you've, we've not met, uh, I'm not very technologically advanced. Like, I had an Android phone, like an old one. I don't know. It, who's our... Where's my Android users? All right, all five of you. Where's my iPhone users? Okay, okay. So I stuck with, I stuck with Android like from the beginning um, until finally it was my daughter. My eldest daughter was like, mother, will you please? And so they got it. When your kids get older, they have money <laughs> that they didn't used to have. And so they changed plans. It's kind of nice not to have to get them everything. And so they changed plans. And she gave me her old iPhone 8, which I'm still using right now. All of you iPhone 14ers out there, I, you know who you are. Uh, I've got my iPhone 8. And, and it's, been, it's been great. It's been great. But one of the problems I noticed is that I could no longer use my headphones, my old Android headphones with my iPhone. What, why did they, they, more money. That's all that is. And, it, and, it's, and it's as irritating. And, you know, it's, I, there's no place to plug it in. Well, of course, the obvious thing is, well, you just have to buy wireless. Well, did I mention I'm cheap? <laughs> like, pretty hardcore. Pretty hardcore. So, a month ago, I broke down. I actually, I know. We can all make progress. All of us, in every little way. I actually bought myself a pair of wireless headphones, okay? And what I figured out is that wireless headphones are different than wired ones. I mean, if you know, you know, and apparently like 99% of this audience knows. But I did not know that when you put that piece in your ear, the first time I did it, I heard a tiny voice, and it said, what? Oh, 
Well, there you go. Mine says connected. I got good ones. I did it. That cost $25. I, no lie. No lie. And it was the best 25 I've sent because hearing that connected for the very first time. And here's the thing. Continuous connection is possible. We think it's not because we haven't experienced it. It is possible as long as what? As long as you stay connected to the source. When you take that earpiece out, you are not connected. You put it back in, and you know, sometimes I take it out, and then I just put it back in, and I hear it say connected again. It's really cool. Uh, I'm, yeah. Um, yes. And also... What I learned, and again, not surprised to you, but it was to me. I'm just teaching you what I learned. We never teach. We just, it's what we we discover. Proximity matters. You can have that earpiece in. And when you walk too far, what happens? You are disconnected. The Lord speaks in in many ways. If we'll just listen to him, just listen to him. It matters. Everyday joy is possible as long as we remain connected to the source. So, I was going to say, the next time you hear the word connected, I hope it's a reminder to you. So, the next time you hear paired or pairing, whatever, what does yours say? What word could you think of? What key could you just go in as like, Remind me again, stay connected to the source, which is the Lord. Because some of us, mm, I'm going to let you preach on this, uh, Vincent. Some of us are more connected to our phones than to our joy. And it shows. It shows. So I'm going to just leave that there and you can pick that up some other time. So that to command to rejoice is immediately followed by the phrase, I'll say it again, rejoice. Guys, Paul is not kidding here. The Spirit of God has impressed on him our need for repetition to remind us of the vital importance of our joy. Uh, there's There's a literal translation. This word again in the dictionary, it, 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 it translates this word anew. And I really like that because not only does it have the idea of repeated action, but there's some freshness there. Yes. Is there anybody who could use some fresh joy? Yes. And the idea here is that our joy is not only continual, it is continually being renewed. It's refreshed. And that's what reminded me of this uh, gorgeous description in Isaiah's Chapter 58, where he says this, the Lord will guide you always. That's our other key word, always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring of waters whose waters never fail. You hear that continual? It's that rhythm. It's that river of joy. If you and I will pray for this kind of God-sourced joy and satisfaction that feeds our souls, that's what's going to overflow into the hard places in our life. Fresh joy does not deny or ignore the challenges, the irritations, or the outright adversities we encounter. Early in, in the letter, we didn't read it, but Paul refers to the doubt and the fear of the readers who were living in a hostile world, much less Paul's own imprisonment. Let's keep that in mind as he is, as he's writing. This new attitude of joy doesn't insist that everything is fine. Rather, it insists that in the very midst of the worst situations, God remains faithful and good and will supply us with soul joy in which to navigate it all. We don't serve a fair-weather God who's present only in the good times. Here's the kind of God we serve, one who sustains us in the wilderness, 
who sets a table for us in the presence of our enemies and who walks miraculously to us in the middle of a storm. That's our God. That's our God. So Christian rejoicing, this is that wellness that is rooted in the goodness of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why the joy of the Lord is our strength. Yes. Yes. Curse to me that we are as powerful as we are joyful. Yes. Yes, so with joy established and maintained, Paul is going to discuss several ways in which we live it out in our everyday lives. And I want you to really um, focus on that imagery of a river, how a river flows. And I want you to see how joy is going to flow into the various aspects of our lives. And the next principle is this, that everyday joy is inclusive, inviting others to experience God's goodness. Look again, verse 5. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. So it's really fascinating to me that immediately following the command to be joyful, we're told to be gentle. Yes. Isn't that interesting? Be joyful in God and be gentle with others. Whoa. Gentleness, is, it's, that's one of those characteristics that we want to experience from other people, but boy, it is hard to exhibit that ourselves. It's a grace gift, that's why. It means that we remain tender in a world that's tough. This word means to be patient, yielding, and uncontentious. One writer described it as being willing to submit to others, having a readiness to forgive, and just this general disposition of, of, of equity, of kindness our world needs the gift of gentleness gentleness is the evidence that we are resting in the joy of the Lord so gentleness is a gift that we receive from God which we then give to others so when we have overflowing joy and security in Christ we can yield to one another in ways that are life-giving. I like that Paul says that we're to let this way of living and relating be evident. In other words, we're supposed to let it show. Not because you're telling people how you live, but because they can see it in you. Let your gentleness be evident. Now, we didn't read it, uh, but at the beginning of the chapter, Paul addresses conflict uh, within the body of Christ. And in verse 5, the implication is that that same grace is shown to people outside the church, right? Let it be evident to who? All. All. All means all. So the gift of gentleness flowing from our joy does not discriminate between those who, quote, deserve it and those who think we do not. Any temptation to withhold the grace of God from being shared with others, that's what reveals the disconnect between our heart and the heart of God. And when that happens, when we become the obstacle from somebody else experiencing the Spirit of God through us, the only corrective thing to do is to come back in repentance and come back into joy. Come back into joy. Renew it again and then share it with others. So say it with me. Everyday joy is inclusive. It's meant for all. So the next phrase that Paul writes is that the Lord is near, which can be confusing because some scholars see this as a warning, as if um, that he's saying, uh, watch out how you live. Watch out what you're doing. The Lord's watching you. Um, Maybe it is. Uh, others uh, translate it as being a, a reference to the second coming. The Lord is near. He's coming again, which, again, it certainly could be. But I struggle to see how that connects. Again, look at the line of thought. How does that connect with commands of joy, commands of gentleness, and then the next command about worry? 
Why stick second coming in there? And it really, I, this would be something you write in pencil, if at all. This is just me. But what I did discover, what one uh, commentator says, is that the phrase, the Lord is near, yes, it can re refer to God as near, just at, not in time only, as in he's coming near, but also in space, which, of course, we know the Lord is here. He is right here at hand with us. So everyday joy reminds us of the nearness of God, the nearness of God. And when we understand it this way, to me, the flow of Paul's discussion to suggest that the joy we experience overflows in our attitude towards others and in our constant connection with his presence. There's enough to give. Are we, are, are we holding our joy because we feel like we don't have enough to share? Get some more. Envelop, saturate yourself. Ask him to give you joy that's enough to share and to experience it in his presence. Uh, Psalm 73 has always been a particular favorite of mine. Because it tells the story of someone who was in a funk and laid out all manner of complaints before God. But at the end, he comes back into the sanctuary, into the presence of God. And after he recognizes truths of always being with God, being held by him, being taught by him, and being satisfied with him, he sings this, the nearness of God is my good. It's my good. It's good to be near God. Everyday joy reminds us of the nearness of God. In our struggle with people, with work, with school, deadlines, um, traffic lights. Anybody struggle with traffic lights? <laughs> or with our own wigged out emotions. We're not alone. The Lord is near he is God and he is able so we call on him we draw near to him always and again and receive for him all that we need to live the way that he desires next we see that everyday joy helps us release worry and embrace peace verses six and seven are these are so familiar if you've been in church for any length of time because they give us much needed instruction and encouragement for difficulty that we encounter literally every day of our lives many of us can quote it but i wonder if we've ever considered the broader context in which these actions take place which in both the chapter and in the entire book it's joy how we release worry flows from our joy. It's the joy of the Lord and the strength that it provides that draws us continually back to God and enables us to pray with thanksgiving in every kind of crazy situation we encounter as we talk to him about it and trust him with the outcome. Some versions translate in every situation as in every time in every time meaning that as often as there is need in every opportunity pray maybe this is just for me but what if instead of feeling guilty or ashamed that we find ourselves worrying again we simply and humbly return to God we let his joy lead us back into a place of trust and peace I'm coming again, Lord. Here I am again. For every and any occasion, perhaps every day, in which worry comes as this uninvited guest, what if we reconnect with God's joy and his presence? I also want to suggest that the phrase, in every situation, implies that the following actions of prayer and thanksgiving with resulting peace can and should be used in a variety of daily activities. What I'm saying, don't just limit it to when you're worried. What if we engaged in prayer and thanksgiving during our commute to work? Oh, wouldn't that be fun? Wouldn't that be different? 
for some of us. Uh, what if we did prayer and thanksgiving as we're washing dishes? As, as we are folding the laundry, perhaps for the fourth time that day, if we just praise God. Oh. Eating around the table. Please tell me we're still eating around the table. What if we started? When we practice joy and thanksgiving and peace every day, that habit is going to carry us through the hard ones. Yes, yes. So begin practicing now. And finally, everyday joy brings our thoughts into alignment with God's will. Listen again to verse 8. Finally, he says, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Your thoughts, my thoughts can derail our joy. It matters deeply what you think. Because whatever you think about, you will pursue. And if you and I want proof, who here can attest to have or have ever having done something stupid and being asked by your mother, what did she say? What were you thinking? Not what were you doing. Because our behavior begins with our thoughts. When our thoughts are focused on ourselves, we become the center of our own world. And gentleness has no place in us because it focuses on the wellness of others. And likewise, when we're focused on ourselves, we become consumed by our own troubles. And worry takes up permanent residence in our vain efforts to control what we cannot. But when we center ourselves in joy, we can think the way God thinks. We can pursue the things that God pursues. And we can love the way that he loves. And this mindfulness, this pursuit of godly virtues, this is more than just thinking good thoughts. I say that because that's not what Paul is saying here. He immediately follows it by saying we're to put these thoughts into practice. It's not enough just to think good thoughts. You got to do it. So you got to do the thing. So I want you to practice shortly, just right here at the end. And I want to ask if anybody has a situation that has the potential to keep you up at night or distract you in the day. Just one little thing. One. So I want you to bring it to mind. Now, can you think of something about that situation that is true? I'm not talking about what you think about it. I'm not talking about your opinion about it. I want to know, is there something about the situation that's true? There might be uncertainty, all kind of conflict or chaos. But is there an aspect of truth that can be celebrated and cultivated to grow? Yeah, yeah. Can you think of a way to take one right action? Something that others would receive as admirable or being purely motivated by best interests. The virtue of being noble, it includes being honest. So is there a way that you could introduce honesty into that situation? And what would it look like to do all of those things, combining our thoughts and our behaviors and our joy together? Put it into practice. So scripture says, if we do these things, if we always have joy if we renew it again and again and allow it to impact our relationships, our prayer, our thoughts, and our actions, we will experience the peace of God. Whoa. Amen. 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 The band can come back up. Um, I want to close <clears throat> excuse me, by reading this passage one more time. But I want to read it from the message translation as a way of solidifying these principles in our minds always and again and asking the Holy Spirit to speak directly to us. Just let him tell you, where do you start? 
If you can't do it all immediately, where does he want you to start? So Paul writes this, celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in him. Make it as clear as you can to all that you meet that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. Help them see that the master's about to arrive. He could show up any minute. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Summing it up, friends, I'd say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true and noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, and gracious. The best, not the worst. The beautiful, not the ugly. Things to praise and not to curse. Put into practice what you learned from me, what you heard and saw and realized. Do that. And God, who makes everything work together, will work you into his most excellent harmonies. Will you pray with me? Ah, oh, sweet Jesus. You are for our good. You give us all that we need in you. I thank you that you desire us to be happy. You didn't just save us to work for you. You designed us to have joy, complete joy in you, and then to share it. Lord, help us be extravagant with our joy. Help us to look for those who need your joy and to share some of what you've given to us. Lord, help us this week. Oh, remind us in any way that you choose to stay connected. Stay connected. Stay in proximity to you. And when we wander off, Lord, by your grace and by your joy, bring us back. Fill us again. We're so empty, easily emptied. But you are able and you are here. Father, do the work in your spirit. Teach us, oh God, how to receive your truth and to be changed by it. And I ask that in the power and the name of Jesus. give her another great big hand for that word today. As we take this time to stand on our feet, to enter into this time of decision, I think the best place to start is what she said about connection and proximity. Per team, you can come. Today, you might be looking for a connection with Christ today. Best place to start with finding and experiencing joy in your life is to get connected to him. Maybe you have been connected, but your proximity over the last few days and months has you've been distant from him for whatever reason, circumstances, uh, discouragement, or maybe it's just simply just a choice. But today is an opportunity to get connected and to get reconnected with him. As Elizabeth said, God wants you to have joy, but that joy can only be experienced through proximity to him. He's near, but we're the ones who wandered away, amen? And so he's asking and he's calling you to come to him today. Scripture says, come to me all who are heavy laden and a burden. And Jesus said, I will give you rest. So as the praise team sings, some of us are here today to receive you, to pray with you. Um, the 
you are available to come and just kneel and pray for yourself. But all of us should take the opportunity to answer the question, where am I in proximity to Jesus right now in my life? Maybe it's time for me to make the choice to get connected or reconnected back to him. This is your time of decision.